I see your second video. All right, so anyway, so nationalism is, is a big challenge in this time period. Um, in Italy, only 2% of the population spoke what would become the official Italian language. So in Italy, only 2% of the population actually spoke what would become the official Italian language. It's probably the language of the, uh, of the monarchy and of the government. Social differences, religious differences, and ethnic differences limited unity for a lot of these countries. So social differences, religious differences, and ethnic differences limited unity for a lot of those countries. Even in France, that had stable borders for a long time, only 50% spoke proper French. So even France has been a solidified country for centuries. Only 50% of the population spoke proper French. <laughs> All right, so we're looking at reasons now for growing nationalism, and I have five of them. Five reasons for growing nationalism. That's fine. Five reasons for growing nationalism. And be ready to write it in five, Whoa, four. Is this iCarly? <laughs> No, that's okay. All right, here we go. Whoa. By the 1890s, most Europeans had embraced the idea of national belonging. So here are the reasons why. So most Europeans had embraced this idea of national belonging or nationalism by the 90s. Number one, modern nation states impose centralized institutions okay. that reach the lowest citizens. These aren't short. These are like, they're not like a word. Okay, hang on, let me say it first. Modern nation states impose centralized institutions that reach the lowest citizens. So basically meaning that like the government was now focused on like pushing down as much of their agenda to the lowest levels oh, as possible. Public school? Sure, public school is part of that, yes. I'm just <laughs> Modern nation states impose centralized institutions that reach the lowest citizens. So for example, things like universal mail conscription. Or military conscription, where like you might be forced to be drafted in the military. And I don't mean like us, where it's like we sometimes have a draft. Some countries have it to where they have a draft normally. What? Like Israel does that, yeah. Everybody is. So you see, like everybody when they got a high school in Israel has to go in the military minimum two years. Like Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot, she she was in the military for two years because that reason, even though she was a, a model and stuff. Yeah. So, universal military conscription. Free education, compulsory education, the taught language and traditions, common currencies, everybody's using one national currency now, a national post office. Wait, I thought we all had to go there and space them out because all of them. Exactly. Um, but anything to like drive national culture, we've already mentioned how like industrialization helped us too, like with all the transportation networks being easier and better. Which brings us to number two. Number two is improve transportation and communication networks. Number two is improve transportation and communication networks. So industrialization had helped do this as well because now you can easily travel and now when you travel you have to all speak the same language, right? So if now France is all connected, you all have to speak the common language if I want to go trade in all the areas. So better communication and, and transportation networks kind of force you to have to have... But they did provide free public Correct. Okay. But that's being done by the national government, right? Okay. Well, we certainly have a Right. So all that rural isolationism was being shattered. Rural isolationism was being shattered as a result. Rural isolationism was being shattered as a result. And so the more they grew their national markets, and, like, and the fact that I can grow something or make something over here in this southern part of France and sell it to northern France, that just drove more nationalism too. Three. A rise in literacy rates. A rise in literacy rates, which goes back to? Literacy sure, yes. <laughs> Government forcing kids to go to school, right? Compulsory schools. I was just looking for like elementary education, right? So like the government forcing kids to go to school at a young age. So, Wait, so two was public transportation? Yes. And then what was the third? Three is rise in literacy rates. Okay. It helped people read more about national history or current politics. So the rise in literacy because of compulsory school led to more people reading about their country, their history, their current politics, so on. So the, lot, the rise in literacy rates also helped improve nationalism. Oh no, 
four. Groups of intellectuals and politicians also push national pride. So groups of intellectuals and politicians also push national pride. Like uh, J.G. Feech, who we talked about in Germany. No, J.G. Feech. <laughs> and the Grimm brothers, who we talked about in Germany, help push nationalism there. So groups of intellectuals or politicians who help push national pride. Uh, there is a guy to be aware of in Germany. You don't have to know this guy, but I'm just write his name because I, I, if I say it, you're like, how do you spell that? <laughs> Heinrich von Treitzkling. So there's this guy in Germany, a his, history professor, Heinrich von Trotskitz, or Trotsky, <laughs> championed German superiority over other nationalities. Oh. So he championed German superiority of their culture over other ones like Britain and other European groups. Scholars researched old-fashioned stories and old folk stories to kind of find how they could have more of a shared common culture. So a lot of intellectuals went and researched old folk stories or old traditions and customs they could kind of bring out to like have as a shared common culture. They try to point... They try to point out the ways they were similar. Shared common languages, stories, religion, shared experiences. Oh, wait, but isn't this like the Olympic or Sure, but like, I mean, there's some of that, but like at this point, I think they're still in that high of like trying to maintain, a, they're trying to still kind of nation build. So I don't, think they're, I don't think they're trying to divide up that way as much. Even if they think that, they're still trying to like bridge the gap together. That's yeah, it's four. So four was uh, groups, of intellectuals, and politicians coming together to like promote national pride. Um, but it, but it also has a negative effect, obviously, right? The negative effect here is that if we're focusing so much on what makes us alike, anybody who doesn't fit that mold is then what? Yeah, they're persecuted or they're or they're uh, or they're targeted because of that reason, like like European Jews. Five. The last one. New symbols and rituals also brought in nationalism. So new symbols and rituals will also be brought in to support nationalism. So they try to find like common holidays or common festivals they can celebrate to like celebrate as a national culture. Kind of like what France did back in the French Revolution, right? Where they try to like push out all these new customs and culture. But now it's like they were ahead of the curve by 100 years. Now they're going to, everybody's in this now in the 1890s. Right. So they push things like new flags, capital cities, military uniforms, national anthems, all that to help support nationalism. So they come out with things like common flags, they, they uh, build into the capital city more, made common military uniforms, national anthems. You also get new national holidays like France started to celebrate Bastille Day in the late 1800s. Now that they're a republic again, and the fact that they basically settled on being a republic in the late 1800s, now they'll celebrate Bastille Day. Right, but it was like the, the start of their first republic, right? It's when republicanism started in France. Oh, that too, yes. Um, public squares and parks started to get like statues or monuments. So that's another way to carry common culture. So parks started to get like statues and monuments as well. Like Trafalgar Square, Trafalgar Square was put together in London to celebrate their big victory over France back in the Napoleonic Wars, right? At the Battle of Trafalgar. Yes, or the uh, Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Yeah. All right. Anyway. All right. Nationalism and racism. Nationalism and racism. In the last third of the 1800s, nationalism now took on a populist, more exclusionary tone. So nationalism is also taking on a populist and exclusionary tone. Us versus them. What makes us the same, and so what makes them different? And so if you have groups in your own country that are that way, then you're going to start focusing on that factor. Like what makes them not really all French or not really German? So there's a very us versus them mentality that develops here with nationalism and a lot of racism. 
After the 1870s, supposed scientific understandings of racial differences added layers to this. So now you have all this scientific research outbreak in the late 1800s, like Darwinism, yeah, like Darwinism, and, and like people using more scientific research, psychology, sociology, and so they take some of those same scientific methods and try to apply it to like people, and try to prove how some races or people might be scientifically better than other people. So they're trying to use now science to that's argue, not, huh? That's, a, that's not a, right. Yeah, I know. Right, we own it. Right. It's not, it's not right at all. But they're trying to use science to argue that some people and some of their skeletons and bodies and stuff are better than other groups in Europe. Um, so, for example, uh, hang on, let's reply. Wow, I'm so blind. I need this to see if I can see. I'm yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Like, I think that was a little uh, Many believe, so many believe that race was a product of heredity. Do you believe that race was a product of heredity? National characteristics were supposedly passed down generation to generation. So basically they thought national characteristics were supposedly passed down. So if the, the strong French nationalism backgrounds for your great-great-grandfathers get passed down. They will believe that, Yeah, they get passed down through generations. So French, English, German, Jewish, Slavic backgrounds will all get passed down if you keep your culture pure and so forth. Scientific racism supposedly used facts to show superior bloodlines and heredit uh, hereditary or heredity. So scientific racism supposedly used facts to show superior bloodlines and heredity. And we did that in America the same thing with whites versus blacks. Like we try to show ways that African Americans were not as great as whites were because like they're they're predisposed to not be as smart or whatever the case is. The same things happen here. All right, scientific racism examples. So Count Arthur de Gabinou, Gabinou, so Arthur de Gabinou, this guy right here, wrote this book on the inequality of the human races. So he writes this scientific book about how races are different. I don't know. He's a count, so he's a doctor. Yeah. So this count... De Gabineau wrote his book on the inequality of the human races in the 1850s, and he uses pseudoscience to basically argue that certain races are better than others. What nation is he a part of? Uh, his name is what De Gabineau. What do you think is? Oh. Yeah. He divided humanity into white, black, and yellow races based on geographical locations. So he divided. Uh, humanity into white, black, and yellow races based on geographical locations. And he championed the white Aryan race for its superiority. He championed the white Aryan, A-R-Y-A-N, race for its superiority. But you can see here how they like try to use like skull shapes and sizes to like point out how different races were different. Yeah. And you can see he had, see this is obviously going to influence like later on Nazi Germany. This is like people in Germany who are like measuring people's facial facial features to like oh my God, prove their killed. yeah that they were like uh, racially inferior. Yes. Yeah, so this one it was this guy who like he got infected in Nazi Germany and he killed his demon director. The most Aryan person ever seen in my life. Jewish, yeah. And so it has no bearing on that stuff. Anyway, um, so social Darwinism was also applied to other nations' races to support their idea of inferior races. So social Darwinism, the idea that like the German Aryan race is better than like the British white race, whatever you want to, want to call it. So like they would use uh, social Darwinism to apply to other nations' races to like support this idea of uh, inferior races there too. In America, it's the same thing. Like in America, a lot of wasps are pushing like Anglo-Saxon culture here in America. Uh, more and like obviously they're not supporting African as being a, a good race, but even like Southern Italians or like Southern Europeans, Irish, they, they say those guys were inferior. We're going to stop.